Have you ever felt so worried that stress seemed to take over your life? That you lost sight of the whole picture? And that you started yelling at the people you love the most only because they were there? in the wrong place, at the wrong moment. I know I have, and I think that most people feel this distress sometimes. But for some people, this is everyday life. One out of 10 people in Flanders live in poverty. For children, the ratio is even one out of eight. In an average classroom, that would mean three children. Their parents are constantly living in stress, dealing with an endless series of problems. Obviously, this has a strong impact on their lives. These feelings are a burden on family relations and often make them very conflictive. Dr. Petra Adriaansen and Dr. Lieve van Hee say that the development of children is at risk. Um, when the interaction between parents and children is colored by poverty. I'd like to translate this as poverty leads to a lack of space. A lack of space in many ways. People in poverty often live in tiny houses. Also, their social networks are very, very limited. And their head is often so full of everyday worries that it's sometimes hard to stay breathing. So their physical, social, and mental space is very limited. And there is no financial space to get away once in a while. So what if we start to look at poverty by using this concept of space? What if poverty leads to a lack of space? And what if the answer to this problem lies in creating space once again? Space is freedom. Space to move, space to think, space to discover, space to learn. Space for beauty. Space for dialogue, for understanding, and space for vulnerability. What if the value of social policy and social work lies or correlates in its extent to which it creates space in people's lives. If you look at society nowadays, do you think we are on track? And what if we, we take a look at social work? I am a social educator, active at the Ruimtevaart and engaged in the fight against poverty. And in my daily work, I meet a lot of social workers. And a lot of them, feel a severe sense of urgency. They feel they are losing grip on the situation of the people they are trying to support. And in response to that, and it's a human reaction to do that, in response to that, they grasp to certainties and get into a more severe approach. So we start to define for others what we expect. We formulate um, what we expect in, in action plans. Huh? Concrete objectives have to be obtained in a limited schedule. And while we do that, we tend to create the exact opposite of space. So, stop telling people what to do when they are in trouble. Because if we want to support people, we have to think in a totally different way about supporting, about helping. People in poverty often tell me that they feel so worried that it's hard to enjoy their children. That they feel so out of energy that it's difficult to play and relate. Poverty is in control of everything. And sometimes people feel so tensed up that they start yelling to each other and to their children. People in poverty often tell me about severe conflicts in the family. 
because if you don't know what to eat in the evening and you don't know where to sleep at night, there is no place for light-hearted joy with your children's play. So for now, it seems simple. We stop telling other people what to do, we create space in people's lives, they have less stress, make less conflict, and we have happier families. But it's not simple. It's easy in theory, but not in practice. Because we have to make a real switch in our dominant ways of thinking about helping and supporting people when they are in trouble. And we have to create space at at least three levels. Physically, socially and mentally. And those three levels, they influence each other all the time. So first of all, we have to create mental space. Worried about the future of children. Society often responds in taking over or buffering the role of parents when they're dealing with lots of, a lot of stress. And although a teacher, for example, can be a great preventive buffer for children, we should not forget to support parents. And we should support them in finding the energy and oxygen to take up their role. And we have to support them to find ways to really make space to relate to their children, despite of the strangling power of poverty. And we have to help them to leave poverty at the door for a little while, as a jacket you hang on a coat rack. It's about the creation of sacred moments, a granny at the mobile calls it, and maybe that is the best way to describe it. It's about giving poverty a break, and in the meanwhile, something else is made possible. It's about interrupting a life in constant stress, intervening in time and space, and making it possible that a diversity of people can really relate with each other on an equal basis. But to do that, I'm first going to give an example, because then you understand it better. We, we use a diversity of, of strategies to do that, to create those space. And every strategy is, is articulating and supporting the intention of people of making space for each other, for the moment and for the children. An example at the mobile is that when starting, the names of the children are written on the blackboard. And it effectively says, I'm here. I'm here with you and I'm here focused on you because I'm writing your name here. When we want to create this mental space, we have to intervene in the social and physical environments of people. Because when you live in poverty, this kind of really open spaces are rare. More often, families in poverty are confronted with unequal relations, with helpers, for example, with clear outline courses and well-described objectives. And it's not easy to hang poverty at a coat rack. It is no jacket. It's only possible for a little while and with a little bit of support. So we have to consciously create these really open spaces in society to help and support people to put stress and poverty aside. And if we do this, to, cre to create those spaces, we have to know that they are characterized by several criteria. We call it sanctuaries. Sanctuaries, they're really open spaces. And they have several criteria. The first one, they are really cooperative places. The participants work together on an equal basis. Second, they are really open places. 
everyone is welcome and also the most social excluded groups have access. And it's not only in theory. Third one, there are as few rules as possible. And the rules that are there have to do with mutual respect, rejection of violence and rejection of exclusion. Five, they exist in spite of poverty, conflict and distress. Four, <laughs> five, there are no predefined objectives. Everything that's happening is happening in the room. So different forms and activities can occur, but they are the result of the people in the room and of the moment. And last, someone is guarding the criteria. It can be one person, it can be the group, but it's important, they cannot be changed. Everything is open, but this has to be there. So, these open spaces can be seen as open public structures in society. Different forms, different activities can be developed, but they are always the result of the people, adults and children in the place. And not the daily struggle, but the dreams, the ideas and the passions of the participants are at the table. And for a certain time, in a certain place, people escape from poverty and are free to be human. When people live in the deepest poverty, the possibility to relate, the possibility to play and to discover is at risk. And it is necessary that we create these open spaces so that parents and children can really meet each other. And sometimes miracles happen. I'll never forget the moment that Fred was playing theater on stage, being homeless at the same time and a number of fragile moments between parents and their children. So what do you think? Can these spaces be an answer for conflict and inequality in society? Yeah, of course. The lowest incomes have to rise. And we have to fight discrimination, racism and war at all costs. We have to change the structures in society that make inequality endure. Because if every family was treated equal and everyone had the means to live, we wouldn't have that much stress and conflict, don't we? But at the same time, we should cherish those precious sanctuaries, those really open places. Because I think we can learn a lot of them. We can learn a lot about how we can deal with differences in society, with inequality, with conflict. And even for those who live in the most bad of life conditions, they have the real power to make us all human again. <laughs> 